Hello everyone, welcome back to this channel. So in this video, we are going to look into IGCSE Physics Chapter 3, Forces and Motion. And these are a list of topics that we will explore. First, we'll understand what are the different types of force that, is, um, that we experience on a day-to-day -day basis, and followed by a specific type of force called cap gravity, and how the gravity on different planets will be different. Then the third subtopic we'll go through is how the term force, mass, and acceleration, in which we touch on chapter 2, they all interrelate with each other. Last but not least, we'll finish up with momentum and impulse, which describe how to quantify the impact of a force, and what are the different quantities, scalar and vectors quantities that we have. So without further ado, let's dive deep into the first subchapter, which is on force. So forces are basically just pushes and pulls that affects objects as they move. And the unit to quantify forces are called Newton, which is named after the famous physicist, Sir, Alex, Sir Isaac Newton, and because of his contribution in the mechanic physics. So, so here are the different types of force. First, we have weight. So the weight here is not how heavy you are. Um, in fact, that's mass. But um, in day-to-day -day conversation, we we'll use weight. But weight in physics is basically just the gravitational force exerted by the Earth um, on all the objects on Earth. They are pool of gravity. And then we also have contact force, which is, so for instance, I'm holding this pen now, and gravity is acting on it, but then the reason it doesn't fall down is because it has contact force between um, this pen and also my finger. All right, it stops us from falling through the floor, or we can say how it stops this pencil from falling down. And the third types of force, we have frictions. The force that act when two surfaces rub each other. And air resistance. So it's very much like friction, but it happens in the air. Um, and also water. And water is called drag. So drag is for liquid. And air resistance is specifically for air. So the last type of force is up thrust. So when you're swimming, you will feel an upward push of the liquid that push it up even though you don't indent you, you don't insert any force in it so here are the five different types of force and overall all types of force when it is unbalanced unbalanced means either we have a stronger downward force or stronger force to the right or left will do two things mainly the first thing is that it will change cause the object to change speed for instance in the car example here if you want to increase the speed of the car, you want to accelerate it, you need, the engine will need to exert some additional force to counter the friction that's on the road. And besides changing speed, an unbalanced force can also change the direction. For instance, in this example, an, a direct force, an uh, unbalanced force will change the direction of the ball. And here's the, um, the first law that we'll learn called Newton's first law. It says that a body will remain at rest or move at a constant speed in a straight line unless acted upon by a resultant force, which is related to what we just talked about here. If there is no force, if the force are balanced, an object will always be, for instance, in the car, it will be in constant speed. Whereas, um, same goes to this ball. If there's no external force acting on it, no friction, it will just keep on moving in the same direction forever. That's when Newton's first law comes in, because when there's no resultant force, it won't change direction. It won't certainly change in its speed. All right. So, so now, now let's understand what what does Newton say here when he said resultant force. So in the, in this example here, two person is pushing this box here, and each person let's assume that they are exerting a force of two hundred newton. So resultant force is the sum of multiple forces. So in our case here, since the 200 Newton is exerted in the same direction to the right, we can say that there is a resultant force of 400 Newton towards the right hand side. It's like one person exerting 400 Newton. Whereas um, here we have a work example here, which shows what if the two forces are in an opposite direction. 
So in here, we have the engine exerting 600 Newton to cause the car to move, whereas 400 Newton towards the left is the friction. So in order to calculate the resultant force, we have to turn this force, you can turn either one, but I will turn this one into negative. And as a result, we have 600 Newton minus 400 is minus here because this is in the opposite direction. And therefore, the resultant force is 200 Newton. The keyword is to the right hand side. And understanding what resultant force is important in a lot of the application and a lot of the question we'll be solving in a while. So in this case, um, we have another case where the engine thrust is 600, exit 600 Newton force, and the friction is also 600 Newton. And if you remember New Newton's first law, if there's no resultant force, in this case, 600 minus 600 will have exactly zero Newton, meaning there's no resultant force. And it means that it, it doesn't necessarily mean that this car will stop. It's just that if it is moving at its rate of 20 meter per second, it will remain at that speed. Like Newton's first law, if there's no external force, if the object is at rest, it will remain at rest. But if the object is moving, it will remain at the same speed. So it's either remaining at rest or you move at the constant speed, like before. All right, so that's all about force. We'll definitely look into how we can apply the different types of force and question later. But before that, now we'll dive deep into a specific type of force called gravitational force, which is force exerted by the Earth on every object in the Earth. And under this chapter, we'll also dive into the further subtopic, like what is gravity? and also what happens during free, free falling and like a skydiver and what are the forces involved when an object is moving in a circle. So make sure you watch to the end. So here we have a falling ball snapshots that basically explain why this ball as time passes here, as time passes, it moves further and further. And the reason this is so is because um, the ball is moving faster at each second, is accelerating, um, as we learned in chapter two. And what causes it to accelerate, right? So here we have an answer here. I will highlight it using the um, yellow color line. Is the force of gravity that is pulling the ball down. So gravity is basically that the Earth is exerting a force like this. Imagine there's a hand here. <laughs> I'm not very good at drawing, but imagine there's a hand here that um, exert force to pull the ball down, and that's gravitational force. And the amount of force used exerted on the object is what we call weight. So for instance, um, later on, if I say that uh, I have a fault weight of 500 Newton, it, it means that there's 500 Newton of force exerted by the gravity on me as a person. All right. So the, on Earth, here we have a fact is that for every kilogram of object, 9.8 Newton will be exerted on the object. So I have an example here. So two balls, one is five kilogram, the other one is one kilogram. And they will all fall down because gravity is pushing them. And for one kilogram of matter, from the example we learned just now is that 9.8 Newton of forces pulling it down. Whereas in this 5 kg example here, we will have 9.8 multiplied by 5, which will be 49 Newton pulling the ball down. All right. So the question here is that which ball will touch the ground first? And intuitively, you would thought that, well, the 5 kilogram ball will touch the ground first because the small force. But is this not the case, especially when you learn about Newton's second law later? Um, the answer to this question is basically both walls will touch the ground at the same time because um, the gravity is pulling the ball together. They, they are pulling each kilogram. So I split this ball into five parts. So imagine that gravity is pulling all of them down at the same time. So therefore, regardless of the weight of the ball, both balls will touch the ground at the same time. So that's just one thing you need to take note of. All right, so we know that just now we said that gravity will cause something to fall down 
and then it also calls the object to accelerate and this accelerate is called the acceleration of free fall and the other name for this is called the acceleration due to gravity all right so now let's we have been talking about weight for a long time now so let's learn how to calculate an object's weight and do note that if today I said I'm 60 kilogram, uh, I'm not saying that this is my weight. In fact, that's actually my mass, usually in kilogram. And in order to calculate weight, there's a formula here in which you multiply the mass, kg, by the acceleration of free fall. And the acceleration on free fall is basically usually 9.8 on Earth. And it's the other way around. Um, it's another value in another planet. So there's so here we have a slide on the difference between mass and weight. So mass is basically how much matter an object is composed. Of. So the mass of this pen is going to be the same on Earth or on Moon. It's going to be the same because the matter here is constant. Whereas the weight of something is the gravitational force that act on this object. And the weight of this pen here is going to be different on Earth as compared to it is on Moon. So that's, that's um, one term. So we have two terms, weight, mass, acceleration of free fall. And that's the third term. We have a third term here called gravitational field strength. It's basically a term used to describe how much gravitational force in Newton that acts on one mass of kilogram in a certain planet. So we have two planets here, planet Earth and also planet um, Moon as an examples. So on Earth here, um, Earth exert 9.8 Newton per kilogram of object, all right? So meaning if this pan is one kilogram, there will be 9.8 Newton pulling it down. Whereas if this pan is on the moon itself, the gravitational field strength is lower. Um, here, it is only 1.6, meaning that if this pan is on the moon only and its weight 1 kg, only 1.6 Newton of force is exerted on it to pull it down. Okay, so let's look into some work example to help you grasp the concept. Um, we have a bag of sugar that has a mass of one kilogram. So its weight on Earth is 9.8 Newton because W equal to mg is the formula. So if my sugar is one kilogram and the gravitational field strength of Earth is 9.8, just gonna plug that in. I have one times 9.8, which you 9.8 Newton. That's what they are saying here. They're asking, what is the weight of the sugar on moon? And assuming that the acceleration due to gravity on moon is 1.6. So I'm going to use the blue equal to mg again. So because the mass of the sugar is going to be 1, won't, nothing will change here. Therefore, I'll use 1 as my mass. And the g here, gravitational field strength, equivalent to a gravitational acceleration, is 1.6. So I'm going to do 1 times 1.6. So the ultimate answer will be 1.6 Newton on the bag of sugar. And ta -da, so that's the answer. And question B, the weight of the sugar on the planet Jupiter is 23 Newton. So now, again, using the same formula, W is equal to 23. And the mass of the sugar will still be 1, regardless of you know where it is. So my mass is going to be 1. And our question is, what is the gravitational field strength of the planet? So to find G, I just use 23 divided by 1, which is 23 Newton. Or you can say um, the, the gravity, um, acceleration of free fall is 23 meter per second square, so which is a little bit higher than on Earth. So that's it. Gravitational field strength, 23 meter per second square. So um, here's the positive question that asks, how is the weight of an object defined? And before learning this chapter, you might say that the answer is B, meaning just how heavy it is. But after this chapter, you should know that the weight is basically the gravitational force that's pulling the object down. So the answer, answer should be donkey, the force of gravity acting on an object. Yes, D is the answer. So second question. An astronaut buy a five kilogram tint on Quality Street chocolate. So he bought a chocolate on Earth, and then very funnily, he bought the same chocolate to the moon. Now, what is the mass of the team? So do note that here, they're asking for the mass. 
not the weight. And the mass of an object will not change regardless of where it is placed. So the mass of the tin on the moon will be exactly 5 Newton. But if let's say the question asks for weight instead, because the gravitational field strength on the moon is lower, so the chocolate there will have a lower weight. But in this case, it's mass, so it's going to be 5 kg. All right, so let's look into the sub subtopic of this subtopic, falling through the air. So all objects here, we, we mentioned just now, they fall with the same acceleration on Earth. But today, a watermelon will fall faster than a feather. And it's not because the gravitational acceleration is different, but because of the air resistance um, overcome by this feather is greater. All right. So let's look at um, this skydiving example to help us understand how um, people are able to do this with their parachute. So just to know that as the driver, as the skydiver is falling down, its weight does not change. And at first, the weight is going to be the weight, which is the gravitational force on peop, on a person, is going to be greater than the air resistance. And hence, we have a resultant force. To be more precise, is a resultant downward force. And when there is a resultant force, an object will accelerate according to Newton's first law. And this is why the speed of this parachute increases. Point number three. Because the, when the speed increases, the more um, the air collides with the parachute faster. And as a result, air resistance increases. Until one point, the air resistance is equal to the weight of the parachute. And this is when the parachute reaches a form called, which is a speed called terminal velocity. So remember, now there is no resultant force. It doesn't mean that the parachute will stop, but it's just that it will maintain at its highest speed. It's just that the speed will not be increased anymore. And the exact speed is what we call terminal velocity. It's the maximum velocity attainable by an object as it falls through. All right. And now the, the parachute is falling down at a very quick rate. And in order to stop, he, gets, he just cannot just um, move like that. Otherwise, he would die. Therefore, he needs something called like a parachute. So this, what this parachute does is that the moment it's open, it's going to greatly increase the air resistance. All right. So there will be the air resistance will be much higher than the weight of the parachute. And as a result, the force again become unbalanced. There's a force upward, which causes the parachute to decrease in speed. And now the parachute will reach a new terminal velocity around 10 meters per second in which he can safely land. So that's the five to six points um, that the parachute encounter. So here we have also the speed time graph of the parachute. Um, that's something we learned in chapter two. If you need to learn more about it, you can watch my chapter two video. So initially, the parachute speed increases drastically because there's a resultant downward force. The weight is a lot greater than the air resistance. And as the speed of the parachute increases, the air resistance also increases. Until a point when the weight and also the air resistance equal each other. This is when the parachute reaches terminal velocity. And in order to slow down, parachute is released here. And then now the parachute will speed will decrease to a point where he can safely land. And um, by the way, if you're watching this and you want to get the slides here to revise or you're a teacher, you want to use it to teach in your classroom, please feel free to visit my website down in the comment section. And um, thank you for, to, for always supporting. And that's it. Let's move on. Uh, another part of your question. A skydiver is falling at terminal velocity. He has not yet opened his parachute and he then opened his parachute. So what is the direction of both the velocity and also his acceleration? And the direction means whether he will go up, go down or up. And for velocity, obviously, since he or she will still be moving downwards, the velocity is going to be downwards. But as for the acceleration, if you remember when after the skydiver opened his parachute, 
the air resistance now is higher than the weight. And therefore, he or she will not um, be going at the same speed anymore. He, he, will, he or she will go slowly. So the acceleration, instead of going downwards, there's a force of acceleration going upward to cause the skydiver to slow down. And that's why the direction of velocity is going to be downward and acceleration is going to be the other way around. That slows the skydiver down. And that's how we can answer it. And the answer should be C, correct. So um, here's the paper four question. A vertical cube contains liquid. A metal ball is held at rest through this metal ball and it's shown in the diagram. And the diameter is much greater than the diameter of the ball, meaning it can just fall very easily. The ball is released and it accelerates downward uniformly for a short period of time. The ball reaches terminal velocity. I just want you to see that how similar this question is to our parish to our skydiver example. They're basically the same thing, just without the parachute. So when they say describe and explain the motion of the ball until it's, it's, when it's released, until it reaches terminal velocity, we can basically just talk about stuff that we just talked about in our skydiver example. So first of all, the weight, we can talk about the weight, how it is greater than the air resistance, right? And as the ball accelerates, I'm just using short form to save you time, but I will have marking scheme in the back. As it accelerates, the speed increases. And when the speed increases, it's gonna be the air resistance will increase. At the point when the downward force is equal to the air resistance, meaning there's no resultant force, the sky uh, the ball won't speed up anymore. This is when it reaches terminal velocity. But of course, when we write our answer, we do have to write in sentences like this. I've attached a marking scheme here, which is basically just what I discuss. And this is how you can get all one, two, three points. All right. Next, move on to another example. Um, here is a skydiver example. So this skydiver is 4,000 meters above the ground. At time 30, she opens her parachute and here we have a speed time graph. So now we need to describe in terms of forces acting on the skydiver and her motion between leaving the balloon and opening her parachute. So it's the same thing as the last question. So we can just look at how the answer scheme require us. So again, the weight part is mentioned and there's air resistance. And when the speed of the skydiver increases, air resistance also increases. And when air resistance increases, there will be no more acceleration. Okay, acceleration decrease. And until a point where there's zero acceleration, when the weight of the skydiver is equal to the air resistance. So that's just a guide on how you can answer as the question. I think that's the hardest part in IGCSD physics is that sometimes we just don't know um, how to answer the question to get all the points. And hopefully this slide help you then. So now, here's another subtopic, which is which would describe the force that is happening when an object is moving in a circle. So let's read this. When a car turns a corner, it changes direction. Any object moving along a circular path is changing direction as it goes. So if I were to draw a circle here, oops. So if a car, okay, let me draw better. So I have a circle here. And if the car is moving in a circular track like that, it is what they're saying here is that it keeps changing, it just keeps changing direction. So to change direction, remember Newton's first law, without resultant resultant force, an object will just stay on track. That's why if an object wants to change direction, a force is required, which is what's being here. So for instance, if this airplane here wants to move around in circle. Um, while maintaining its speed, you need to exert a force on the left wing or right wing in order to change direction. And second example, um, how moon is able to orbit the earth is also due to force because there is an intangible, cannot, um, invisible force pull of gravity by the earth to move the moon in orbit. So, so here's some facts about um, going round in circle. So if 
an object is moving in circle like that, meaning the force that exerted, um, the force has to be towards the center. In this example, the force is from the Earth gravity. All right. So the size of the resultant force. That means what are the factors that affect these forces? Is that first is mass. The heavier object, the bigger the force is needed to keep it moving in circle. And also, the faster you want it to move, the more force you need. That's pretty common sense. Whereas the third one is radius. That means the smaller the radius of the circle, the bigger the force that is needed to pull the object in circle. So that's just three factors that in affect the force in a circle. And here we have an example of how um, the law of physics is in work here. It's called a wall of death. So basically, all the drivers, they could be driving motorcycle, car, they'll just move around this circle. And um, I'll attach a video here to let you see what it is like. But at first, it looks like magic. But then um, now we know that because they are able to stay on track without falling down, because their tire here um, is in contact with the wall, with all this wall here, that provides an upward force that helps them to stay in balance, okay? The friction force and the weight force is equal. That's why they won't fall down in this example. So that's just one application of how forces are involved in a circling, in a circle setting. All right, so let's look at some past your question. The moon orbits the earth at a constant speed. Which of the arrow on the diagram shows the direction of the resultant force? So for the moon to move in circle, as mentioned, the force directed at it must be towards the center. So it's going to be D. My answer is donkey. All right. So A, um, another question. The diagram shows a motor car traveling on a flat circular track. The speed of the car increases at point P on the diagram, and the car does not stay on track. State in terms of force why the car does not stay on the track at point P. So now we say that in order to move, um, in order for the car to move in circle, uh, the force will need to be directed towards the center. And the car P here no longer stay on track when its speed increases. And one reason could be that, you know, the force is not strong enough to pull it in circle because its speed increases. And because the faster it's moved, the more force is required. So in this example, one reason could be the force is not strong enough to pull it in circle. All right, so that's the answer. And for B, on the diagram, draw and label an arrow with the letter S to show the direction of motion. So if this P, car P here no longer stay in the circle, um, you can just write, draw it like that. This is where it will go, all right? It will leave here and then move towards um, this rig, all right? So that's basically the answers. So now we finish gravity and also how gravity is involved in terms of going around a circle and also parachuting. And now let's proceed to how the following three quantities, force, mass, and acceleration, they all relate to each other. In fact, it's a very famous law called the Newton second law. All right, I'll just write down here. Newton's second law describes the relationship between force, mass, and acceleration. So there's an equation that describe how these terms relate with each other, which is force equal to mass times acceleration. All right, so this law basically states that if an object is very heavy, in order to accelerate it, you're gonna need more force. So for example, let's look at um, this work example. What force is needed to give a ball of mass 10, 0 0.1 kilogram an acceleration of 500 meter per second square. All right, so we have, we need to find F, and we know that the three terms can be related using the equation F equal to ma. And to find force, I can just plug in the mass number 0 0.1, acceleration 500 into the equation. And then if I plug the value into my calculator, I'll get 50, and the unit for force is gonna be Newton. All right, yeah, so that's the answer. So here I want to give you some intuition on how this law basically works. So if 
if I were to exert the same force on, let's say, a, a mass, a ball of mass 1 kilogram, instead of 0 0.1, I increase the mass to 1 kilogram, you'll see that now the acceleration is going to be a lot lower. All right. Um, it's going to be 50 meter per second square. So this law actually makes sense because imagine I have two objects. One is heavier than each one, the other. And if the same force is applied on each item, the lighter object is going to have a faster acceleration. And then, so that's what, um, how these quantities relate together with each other. All right, so let's try to solve another way example to help you solidify your learning. So an Airbus aircraft has four jet engines, each capable of providing 320K of Newton of thrust. And the mass is this heavy. What is the greatest acceleration? So the trick point here is that um, we are having four engines instead of one engine. And according to the question, they said that each engine is going to be able to provide 320,000 Newton. So if you were to find the acceleration, again, we can use the formula F equal to MA. And what is the force here? Um, the force here is going to be 320,000 multiplied by 4 because 4 engines is on the plane. And we can just plug the mass into the equation. And to find acceleration, I can simply use um, the force divided by the mass of the object. So if I were to plug that into my calculator, I'm going to get 2.28 meter per second squared. So that's the acceleration that the Airbus can move. So that's an example of how we can solve it. All right, 2.28. So let's look into another positive question here. A bus drive along a flat road, its engine produces a forward driving force of 7,000 Newton. And drag is also acting on a bus. Drag is basically the air resistance, all right, D. The bus has an acceleration of 1.2 meter per second square and a mass of 2,500. What is the value of this D here? All right, so this is basically a tricky question. First of all, we need to find out what is the resultant force acting on this bus. And how are we going to do that? Since acceleration and mass is provided, I'm going to have, I'm going to use the F equal to MA formula. And I will do 2,500 multiplied by 1.2. And if I were to plug that into my calculator, I'm going to get 2,000, oh, I'm going to get 3,000 Newton. And that's the resultant force acting on the bus. So knowing that the resultant force is 3,000, I can use, so resultant force is going to be equal to forward force minus backward force. So my resultant force is 3000 and my forward thrust shown by diagram is 7000. So therefore I can calculate my drag. So instead of backward, I'll put D. My drag using the formula, 7000 minus 3000. So I have 4000 Newton. And the answer is going to be donkey. So here's donkey, and I'm including, by the way, if you're watching this for the first time, I'm including past the questions so that you can apply whatever you learn in this video into questions. And uh, I believe this question will build your confidence to score in your exam. All right, so let's move on to the last two topics, momentum and impulse. So momentum is an interesting um, topic because a lot of students have told me what they don't still don't understand what it is. So now I want you to think of momentum that is a measure of an object's ohms. So this is a relatively informal way. Or you can say how um, the resistance, the object's resistance to changes in motion. So for instance, I have a train here and also a motorcyclist here. So if they both of them were to move towards this person, obviously we're gonna know, we know that it's harder for the train to stop as compared to the cyclist. So in other words, I can say that this train has a higher resistance towards changing in motion, which is stop. So this bus, I mean, this train here is gonna have a higher momentum than the cyclist. And I believe this will explain better that 
momentum is actually calculated by using the mass of something multiplied by the velocity. Or you can also say momentum is the impact of a force. How much impact the force is making and how if an object has high resistance, that means it's harder to change its motion. So that's um, the formula to calculate momentum. Here's another formula. It's to use momentum equal to mass times velocity. So let's look into the work example. A car of mass 600 kilogram is moving at 15 meter per second. So that's the speed. So to calculate momentum, all we need to do is just to use the formula. Momentum P equal to mv is equal to mass, which is 600, multiplied by velocity, which is 15. And you plug that value into your calculator, you get 9,000. And the formula and the unit for momentum, since we know that mass is in kilogram and velocity is in meter per second, we can just do kg meter per second. It's ba you basically just multiply the two units together. That's about it, 9,000 meter per second. All right, so that's all about momentum, mass multiplied by velocity. So let's move on to impulse. So now we learn what is the momentum. Um, the impulse is basically the change in momentum. Momentum. And some um, here we have a description. The effect of force depends on two things, how big the object is, how big the force is, and the time intervals it acts on. So I have a boxer here. Just imagine that um, you, are the, you are the boxer. If you want a better damage, you're going to touch the opponent's face for a longer period of time. And that basically creates a greater effect on the force. And this is why um, when we look into the impulse formula later, you will see that impulse basically equal to force times time. So you're exerting a force, but the time that you exert the force is going to be affecting the effect of that force. So that's first formula for impulse. You use force multiplied by time. And the second formula is, so another way you can define impulse is the change in momentum. Um, how the momentum changes from one, um, one point of time to another. So let's look into the first work, work example to better understand. A car of mass 500 kilogram is moving at 15 meter per second. So we have the mass, we have the velocity. The driver accelerates gently so that a force of 30 newton acts on a car for 10 seconds. So 30 newton is acted on a car for 10 seconds. We need to calculate the impulse of the force. So again, we can just use the formula here. Impulse is equal to force multiplied by time, in which I will have 500. Um, 30 newton, since that's the force exerted, multiplied by 10, which is seconds. So the impulse is 300 newton second. And that's it. And this impulse thing is, you can also say that the momentum of the car changes by 300 because impulse is equivalent to the change of momentum. And that's the answer, 300 newton second. So that's the unit for impulse. Again, you don't have to memorize. You just have to know that I'm multiplying newton with seconds, force times time. So I just combine this two formula unit into one. So calculate the momentum of the car after the accelerating force has acted on it. So from the previous example, we know that impulse is equal to 300. But we also know that impulse is equal to the change of momentum, meaning the change of momentum here is 300 kg meter per second one. So we, we care about it, the momentum of the car after the accelerating. So before we calculate it, the after effect, we need to calculate what is the initial momentum of the car. And we can calculate it using just the formula, mass times velocity. So let's go back. The mass of the car is 500 kilogram and the velocity is 15. So we will have 7,500 kg meter per second. So that's the initial momentum of the car. And because the change in momentum is 300, to calculate the final momentum, I can simply use 7,500 plus 300. 
and that would give me 7,800 kg meter per second negative one inverse. So that's basically the final momentum of the car. And if we look at the result, and that's the answer here, right? So that's about it. Um, oh, here's a, another question. A force of 500 Newton acts on a rocket for 600 seconds, causing the rocket's velocity to increase. Again, they want to calculate the impulse, which is force times time. I have 500 times 600, which will give me 30,000 Newton, the unit of the force, second, the unit for the time. Let's move on. So that's the answer. And by how much does the rocket's momentum increase? We know that impulse is equal to the change of momentum. Therefore, we can also say the change in momentum is 30,000 kg meter per second negative inverse. Or you can use this unit as well. All right, the impulse unit. So, um, so far we have learned about momentum with force. So here is how we can relate momentum back to the force formula. So from Newton's second law, we know that the equation is F equal to ma. And in chapter two, we also learned that the formula for acceleration to calculate a is v minus u over t. And if we were to expand on this formula, we'll get mv minus mu over t. And hopefully now you can see that mv here, v is the final velocity, u is the velocity, um, in initial velocity, but both are velocity, right? And when you multiply mass times velocity, it's actually the momentum. And mv minus mu, this part here, is basically the change of momentum. Change of momentum. So when you divide, so here I introduce another formula, which is how to relate change of momentum back to force. So when you divide change of momentum by time, essentially you'll get the force of the object. So in this case, force is besides equaling to F equal to MA, it's also equal to change in momentum divided by time. All right, um, here's an application of how this law is in, um, work. So we have a high jumper here. How this cushion is able to reduce the impact is that it increases the contact time. So when this diver fall on this map here, it's gonna, he's going to um, stay down a little bit, be in contact with the cushion a little longer as compared to when the cushion was not there, it's going to fall and then hurt its back. But because when we put a cushion there, um, its time increases. Therefore, this guy here will probably not experience so much of an impact. In fact, he should be okay. And that's because we increase this, the contact time. And when you increase the contact time in the denominator, if this value increases, the amount of force experienced by the, the high jumper here is actually less. Okay, so that's um, let, let us look at one work example on how crash test um, helps, which is um, how the airbag helps passenger to experience less force. So initially, this crash test dummy has a mass of 70 kg, and it comes to a stop in 0 0.03 second in a crash. Whereas in the second test, when the car is fitted with airbag, this dummy takes five times longer to test, which, which means it takes, instead of 0 0.03 second, it takes 0 0.15 second. And what force are acting on the dummy in both tests? And here I have the solution straight away. Force, because we know that we can calculate force using change in momentum divided by time. We can see that in the no airbag example, the dummy experiences 35,000 Newton of force. But then as we increase the contact time, now the dummy experiences only 7,000 Newton of force. And that's a way of how this formula that we um, derive here comes into play. Why is it that when we increase an app, when we implement an airbag, increases the contact time, the driver is actually safer because the force experienced by him or her is less. All right, so that's all about um, 
the change in momentum. So here's another example on momentum. Hitting a ball with a tennis racket before the hit and after the hit. So what happened is that before the collision, the racket is moving to the right. And because the racket has mass, right? And when it's moving, it also has velocity. Therefore, it has momentum on it to the right-hand side. And after the collision, the racket is moving toward the right, but more slowly than before. This is because all the momentum has been transferred to the ball. So the ball now creates momentum. It also has mass. Therefore, its V will also increase. All right. So let's look into um, this principle called principle of the conservation of momentum. Meaning, when the racket touches the ball, so we know that racket has momentum, and when it touches the ball, the momentum is basically transferred all the way to the ball. And that's principle of conservation of momentum, meaning the momentum of the initial object will not be lost. In fact, it will be transferred somewhere else. Okay? And let's look into this work example to better help you calculate how um, this momentum things work. So here we have all the information, the mass, the velocity before it hit the ball, the velocity after it hits the ball, and the mass of the tennis ball, velocity. Okay, so now let's do. The question is, find the momentum of the racket before the collision. And to find the momentum, we use P equal to mv. And the mass of the racket is 3. And the initial velocity is 20. So the momentum is 60 kilogram meter per second. So that's um, the momentum of racket before the collision. And we have our answer here. And now we to, to find after the collision, again, use P equal to mv. Again, uh, the mass of the racket is 3. The velocity is now become 18. And the final momentum is less than what we have previously. We have 60 previously, now it becomes 54. And according to the conservation of momentum, we know that the lost momentum is actually being transferred to the ball. All right, so now we can find out what is the momentum of the ball after the collision, which is six kilogram meter per second, because that's the momentum that the racket lost, loses. So the answer is six, 60 minus 54, equal to 6 kilogram meter per second. And by using the momentum, by having the momentum of the ball, we can calculate its velocity. Again, use the formula P equal to mv, 6, and how heavy is the ball? <laughs> so the ball is 0 0.25 kilogram. So we can use P equal to mv, and we plug the 0 0.25 into the mass. To find the velocity, we simply use 0, 6 divided by 0 0.25, we will have 24 meter per second. So that should be it, the answers. So I'm going a little bit faster. So if you need to digest, feel free to pause the video. So let's look into the past year question. And that's how we can uh, learn better. An airplane of mass 2.5 times 10 to the power of 5 kilogram lands with a speed of 62 meter per second at time zero. And the airplane then decelerate uniformly as it travels along the runway until it reaches 6 meter per second at t equal to 35. Calculate the deceleration of the airplane. So um, here's the formula that we learned in chapter 2. A equal to v minus u over t. All right? And the final velocity here is 6. And initial velocity is 62. I just basically just plug the value in. And we're going to have 6 divided by 62, 6 minus 62. Let's use the calculator, divide by 35. I'm going to get negative 1.6 meter per second square. So the answer is a negative because it's, it's decelerating. So when the question asks what is the deceleration, basically you can convert it into 1.6 instead. So um, the next question, calculate the resultant force on the aeroplane as it accelerates. So we know that to calculate resultant force, we can use the formula that we used, F equal to ma. And mass here is equal to 2.5 times 10 to the power of 5, multiplied by the acceleration we calculated. In fact, it's deceleration, but you can use the same thing. 
and then we can just plug that value in to our calculator and then we'll get 400,000 Newton. All right, so that's it. And calculate the momentum of the airplane when the speed is six meter per second. So to calculate momentum, we use the formula P equal to MV. So mass is equal to, again, the same value multiplied by six, which is the velocity. So if I were to do that in my calculator, I'll get 1.5 million, which is three, four newtons, oh, sorry, kg meter per second inverse. So that's basically the answers. Um, so ne the next question is about how to write sort of like an essay answers. Explain in terms of the momentum of the molecule, why the trapped air gas exert a pressure on the wall. And for this question, I'm just going to show you the answers. Because the molecules, the air molecules here collide with the wall. And because of this, we know that the, the speed of the momentum, or we can say the direction of the momentum also changes. That results in um, the momentum of the molecule changes. And this causes a force, and the force spread out over the wall to create pressure. All right, so that's um, the question. So let's move on to the last subtopic here, which is on scalar and vector quantities. So um, in physics, we will learn different types of terms like acceleration, velocity, and all of this term can be categorized into two categories. So first we have sc the scalar quantities followed by the vector quantities. Scalar quantity is a quantity that has magnitudes but has no direction, whereas the vector quantities, they contain direction. So what I here I have an example, some examples. For instance, there's no direction involved in the following quantities here, like time, speed, mass, energy, temperature. Whereas um, something like force, it can be either to the left or to the right, or upwards or downwards. So direction is important. Therefore, force is a vector quantity. Acceleration, they can either increase in speed or slow down. Same goes to momentum. Feel strength. We'll talk more about this in the following chapters. So that's basically the difference between scalar and vector quantities. So here we have a note here. Force is a vector quantity. So it's important for us to know how to calculate the resultant force when multiple forces are added together. So if I have a force towards the right of 600 Newton and 300 Newton on the left hand side, I'm going to have 300 Newton resultant force towards the right. This is when direction comes in handy because um, direction towards the right and towards the left is going to be two very different things. And let's look into, I believe this is the last question, an object with three forces acting on its shown group below. I have an upward force of 75 Newton plus 35 Newton. So in total, I have 110 down, upward force and the downward force is 200. What is the resultant force? So downward force is 200 Newton and upward force is 110. So we know that there's a resultant force of 90 Newton downwards. So the answer here should be A. And that's the end of this chapter. It has been a pretty long video. And I hope that in this chapter, we have learned the following terms. Let's go back to what we have. Um, we learned what are the different types of forces available and how um, the specific type of force, gravitational force work, and how the three terms, force, masses, and acceleration, they all con contribute together. And also momentum, impulse, and the differences between scalar and vector quantities. And thank you so much for watching. I'll see you in the next video where we'll explore topics on moment.